Right? What about their social media presence? And therefore, when you have the social media, other issues, other things that you can put into the pot and create a better value, then the package that you will say $10,000 for the website, maybe $10,000 for the website, plus, plus, plus other things that the package is attractive to the customer. You're, you're doing things in bundles from a, from a design point of view. You may design. Just mute your mic. I'm hearing your mic feedback. Yeah, so that you are hearing the, 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 the package and you're giving more value in what is being offered as a package and therefore you can put more into the bundle that you're giving. Um, when you look at TST or Digicel, you buy the phone, but here's what they're looking for. When they buy, when you buy the phone and you get the nice little um, offerings that they're giving you and everything is nice, so I pay 250 and I get so many minutes for free and I get this and I get that and I smile and walking out the store. TST and they're happy and Digicel are happy because you are now locked in and their money is being made over the long term. So from a, that point of view, the package that is on offer is attractive and you as the, as the producer would make your money over the long term in what you, what you have. The other one is pricing based on your position. Where are you in the marketplace? If you're known for quality, if I'm a tailor in what we call Savile Row in the United Kingdom, once I am present in that space and you come to me, <laughs> you know your price is going to be high <laughs> because here, yeah, what I am among the creme de la creme. And therefore, you price based on your position in the market. Now, let me ask you, you need to create this. You need to create that aura about and the mystique about what you do and, and, the, and the skill set that you have and the quality that you're putting out. Your customers are able to discern. Your customers are able to discern value. They're able to discern quality. If you price based on your position, you are in a better place, but you must be there based on some underlying benefit to the customer. The last pricing position is a price based on value. Depending on the value of what is being delivered, I can set my price comfortably. Dependent on the value of what is being delivered, I am selling a Rolls Royce. We know that that's expensive. I'm buying selling a BMW. We know it's expensive. The value, the price based on the value that's being delivered. You, on the other hand, as, as by how you 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 look at your pricing you can create value by the quality of products that you inputs that you're putting into your to your out to your to get to your output so the seven principles of pricing strategies that we're looking at for your products is either on the basis of your price as for your as a, your competition and how they're pricing your price to pay your bills your price based on the time that you spend your price based on the cost plus or your price based on a package that you're offering or your price based on your position in the market, and some of that is come, comes with time, and your price based on value. Let me make it clear to you that you may some, it's not one, two, three, any one of them in isolation. That's how, price, that's how I'm pricing. You may find that you may have to mix and match your pricing strategies to suit the circumstances that you're in. With regard to making of masks, Somebody was making a mask in point 40 and they, they called and asked what they should sell it at. And they want to sell it for $50. And they went into the market at $50 for the mask. And then all of a sudden, San Fernando, you hear they were doing masks for $20. And you had to adjust your $50. So you, you have to be always sensitive to the what is happening in the market and be able to adjust what you are doing to suit your customer circumstance. But in order to do that, you have to have an understanding of the underlying cost and what strategy that you are playing in that market space. What pricing strategy that you're going to be adopting. 
you cannot and you ought not to um if you take the view that is your price or the highway take my price or leave it then you may find yourself in a place where people are leaving it and you have no no revenue um do you stand your ground on price and produce less or for a higher cost well that depends it depends on what your circumstances are too because if you have to price and you're pricing right now and you don't have the information as to how you arrive at that price um you could lose your business and you can't go anywhere um you, pro you produce at a higher cost and you want to sell at a higher price then you could lose your market and use your shirt you don't want to do that the market does not appreciate cheaper faster better well that depends it depends there are some segments of the market that will appreciate cheaper faster better there are some segments of the market that don't really appreciate that and don't want that i shop at charlotte street as opposed to i shop in in, in um long circular mall or, or west mall it depends on where i shop and the market that is that you want to serve all right so you, you, the, the, the strategy or how you create that strategy you've got to determine what you're aiming to do there are tools that you have the the, the, the strategies that are out there but you have to understand your market you have to understand the customer in particular what you're aiming for you understand your underlying cost and your underlying cost that you will have to build up and in doing that you can come to your price you may have to to to, do, to survey it as one point of view or you may have to put it out there and see the market response to your goods and services um that too is challenging but over a period of time you get familiar with how people are pricing i have a view in the business that i am in selling to um, working for small and micro enterprise people the same thing i do so for small and micro enterprise people in san fernando the same thing done in port of spain if I'm doing it in San Fernando for five hundred dollars, the guy in Port of Spain is doing it for twelve hundred. We you know something: the customer in Port of Spain will not come to me in San Fernando to pay the five hundred. You have to pay the twelve hundred in Port of Spain. The guy that will come to me is a smaller micro enterprise person who might not, not might not. You don't want to pay the twelve hundred. You might want to pay something a little bit more reasonable and want to get it done. But your market is also can be segmented and you depend on where you are who you are what you do your content of your products and stuff like that you can determine your price and costs so those are the strategies let's get down to the issue of cost and selling price the cost price is the cost that is spent on making producing the goods or delivery of a service. The cost price. There are various elements that make up what the cost of a product ought to be. And you all need to be able to document and understand all the various cost elements that make up the cost of your product. We will discuss that shortly. With regard to selling price, selling price is the price set to sell the goods or service. So there's a relationship between the cost price and the selling price. There is a relationship between the cost price and the selling price. And that relationship, I will say to you that the cost price is always represented at 100%. The cost price is represented at 100%. And therefore, we now want to look as to how we manipulate and look at the cost and pricing to be able to appreciate how, how you make your money. If there's to be a profit of 25% on your selling price, what is the percentage of profit on your cost price? If there is to be a profit of 25% on your selling price, what is the percentage of profit on your cost price? Cost price is always 100%. The cost price is always 100%. And therefore, your selling price is 
which is in order to get that 25% out of it, that 25% is what I'm trying to get out of it, is going to be my profit. So if the cost price is supposed to be the 100%, and I want to get a 25% profit on it, then my selling component is in that realm of that 75%. Look at it carefully now. My cost price needs to be $75. I'm switching from the percentage now to the dollars now. My cost price needs to be $75. My selling price needs to be $100 in order for me to get my 25% selling price. I will go very slowly. Your cost price is really 100% is. And I want to get a 25% on my selling price. And therefore, my selling price is of $100 should leave me a profit of 25. And therefore, my cost is 75%. $25, sorry. So as simple as that, there's some questions that I now need to ask you. As we go along, we'll, in, a, in a classroom environment, we could exchange. I would love to see your questions coming up on the side, but we deal with them one by one. So there are various types of costs. Costs we describe from the point of view of what we call variable cost. Variable cost are costs that does what? Vary in, to uh, in total directly and proportionately with the changes in activity levels. Does it remain the same per unit at every level of activity? Neither of the above or both A and B? My question to you is, variable cost is either vary in total directly and proportionately with the changes in activity level or remains the same per unit at every activity level? Neither of the above or both of the above? With regard to variable cost, Variable cost is what variable cost is. Variable cost is what variable cost is. And therefore, variable cost is cost that vary directly and proportionately to the changes in activity level. So the more you do, the more your cost can change. The less you do, your cost can change. There's mic feedback, so please move your mics. The, the cost that you have, therefore, as variable are always changing based on your activity level. Then the other term is that term called contribution margin. Contribution margin. Is the contribution margin revenue remaining after deducting variable cost? Is the contribution margin the revenue remaining after deducting variable cost? Or it may be expressed as the contribution margin per unit. It is the selling price less the cost of goods sold. Or is it both A and B? The question put, what is contribution margin? The contribution margin is the selling price less the cost of goods sold. The selling price less the cost of goods sold. These two terms, variable cost and contribution margin, for those of you hearing it for the first time, you need to become familiar with it. For those of you who have heard it before, we need to understand it better in what we are doing, because we make decisions based on these two elements in your costing. The other question, cost plus pricing. Now I mentioned cost plus pricing just a while ago. And really what is cost plus pricing? 
Isn't selling price equal variable cost plus a markup percentage multiplied by variable cost? Is it the cost, the selling price is equal to the cost plus a markup percentage multiplied by cost? Is it the selling price equals the manufacturing cost, markup percentage plus manufacturing cost? Is it the selling price equal the fixed cost plus a markup percentage multiplied by the fixed cost? You must understand this thing called cost plus pricing. I go back to the fact that you want to make sure that you cover your cost. And in some markets, you determine what your cost elements are and you put a markup on top of that. And therefore, from a, from a cost plus point of view, this is the selling price equals the cost plus a markup percentage multiplied by the cost. What are you going to mark up at? Multiply by the cost and the, plus the cost equals the selling price, uh, equals the selling price. Cost plus pricing. At this point in time, we have gone through the various pricing strategies. So I did that earlier clock so you know exactly where we are going. The various strategies in terms of um, comparing your pricing but to your customer, trying to break even, uh, making sure you get that break even element, break the pricing. You want to price a package, you want to price for value, you want to price for time, those elements of your strategy. To understand the strategy though, we have to go down and understand how we cost our product. What makes up the cost before we can get to the final price? So where we are going? Today, I expect that you would appreciate the importance of costing products. Taking the time to sit down and cost the various elements of your product. How many of you, how many of you, be it a designer, or be it a seamstress or a tailor, will sit down with a pen and paper and look at the various costs that you have before you determine what you select at? How many of you are doing that? How many of you are sitting down and saying to yourself on black and white on pen and paper, I'm spending X, Y, Z to do something, even if you're designing it. There are various elements that make up the costing. Let me just give you one lesson in the learning of this costing arrangement. It is not an exact science that you were looking at. And therefore, it is only with time you will get better and better at determining what your costs are and be able to be able to price more effectively. If you're not doing it as yet, I will suggest later in our program today how you can sit down and really get down to the nitty gritty of your costing before you determine price. Don't pick that price out of a hat. We also will find a place where we're able to differentiate the various types of costs. So we're going through a series of discussion of what costs look like, what the costs are supposed to be. And in doing that, You'll understand the various terms that the market will use to discuss what pricing is all about. You're going to have a clear understanding of which costs are to be considered when making that pricing decision. You'll have a clear understanding of which cost that you should consider when you're making that pricing decision. We want to appreciate the various costing methods. From an accountant's point of view, we have different ways of how we come to the, to the determination of what cost is, the various elements that we use. On the other side, we will have an appreciation of the necessity of developing a pricing strategy. I want to linger on this a little bit. We want to appreciate the necessity for developing a pricing strategy. You cannot just simply pick a price out of a hat. You cannot simply just say, well, I think I spent so much, I priced it so much, they have to take it like that. <laughs> you know, I mean, some of us can do that and, and probably have to get away with it, but maybe not for long. The issue here is we have to determine what the pricing strategy is. We are working in a competitive market environment and therefore you will first appreciate the cost and the method by which i used to get that cost and then i will determine how i price 
but then we must determine what pricing strategy we are going to look at. And then you will have a clear understanding of the various considerations when setting price. There are many things that you need to deal with. There are many things you need to take into consideration, right? And of course, last but by no means least, you want to appreciate the various pricing models. My success today with all of you would be on the basis that you appreciate the importance of costing a product. I would like that you set your own objective. At the end of this program, I will provide you with a template and a video to guide you as to how you begin to build your cost structures. You may not find it, it's like riding a bicycle. If you get on the bicycle, you're going to fall down and therefore you might get it right the first, second, third, fourth time. But if you are persistent and deliberate in what you're doing and understanding it as you go along, the day will come when you will understand clearly what you're pricing, how, you, how, how it is important it is to do your product costing and the various types of costs that come that are uh, in play. And then you want to you consider how you're going to market this thing and what price you're going to set. And of course, you'll appreciate today the methods of costing that the accountants will use. But the most important thing of all of it, we then look at the game that we play in terms of this strategy of pricing and how we try to win market, win business. And then we want to understand the psychology um, behind this thing of setting a price. You know, many years long ago, um, again, might be saying my age, we had something called Kerpalani and everything inside it was about 99 cents. Or we have these $10 stores or $1 stores all over the place. There's a certain psychology about pricing and what people see, what people see value or perceive value to be. And therefore we have to understand that in the business that we're in. I am, um, I surely feel that I should be pricing just as the boys in Port of Spain, but I truly understand the market that I'm in in San Fernando and the customers that I serve. But that does not mean that I cannot create, I, I cannot create a sense of a better pricing model if I can manage my costs more effectively. So from the business that I am in, I push the technology and therefore I can now do online transactions and business with my clients without having to leave my office. Some of the boys in Port has been out there yet because of, and this was even before the coronavirus came about. Some of them are now galloping quickly to try and put themselves in a place where they can do that kind of business. So the psychology behind how you set the price and then how you use that price to attract market and build customers is important. But we, not, we got to look at value. What are we giving? That shock you a little bit. I don't know how many of you are aware that in the world today, there's a chicken that looks just like the one on your screen. It is black to the look. The internal organs are all black and it's a delicacy in Indonesia where it is found. It is a delicacy. Now, you the Trinidadian have never seen a black chicken might turn your nose up at it. But in Indonesia, because of its uniqueness, because of its uniqueness, this chicken is highly priced. It has happened because of some hyperpigmentation um, things taking place within the chicken, and therefore the uh, the eggs are white. The chicken is black on on the, on the surface, and then the internal organs are all black. And the Indonesian people will pay high value for the uniqueness of the chicken. You know, we get another train out Oh God, it's like looking bad. Eh? But on a flip to this in another marketplace, people see the value of it and the quality of it, and they're prepared to pay a high price. My question to you all, what makes you different than your competitor in your market space? What is that unique proposition that you present that when I come to you, I am satisfied of my value and service and quality? What is that unique thing that you are doing? 
It's not just picking a price out of a hat, people. Whatever the market could be, I'll pay fifty. So I'll pay fifty dollars for 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 a mask in point twenty dollars in San Fernando. And I get it free from the ladies from the Sierra community. I get it free. So why must I pay for it? What value am I getting? Now, here's where we go in. The design of the mask is also going to become important now, and the color of the mask. Okay, the the, the Parliament um, Speaker of the House of of Representatives is saying to you. Come with black mask. So you see a lot of people have the black mask already. But mark my words, you begin to see a different styles and different colors and, and how it look. And, and all of a sudden the market starts to differentiate because everybody has masks now. How would I make myself different with all the masks that we have? How efficiently can I do it? Oh, let's get on to it. I mean, I have three masks. The elastic on the on one end is was of a simple um, not twine, but elastic string then there's the elastic um, kind of inch band so tight and strong different things make the quality of the thing different you have to understand what value you bring to the table at what cost at what price and be able to meet your market where your market requires you to be so let's look at the pricing strategy considerations then. What would we consider in the industries that we are in? In some industries, pricing promote the concept of quality. So in some industries, that's it. Maybe in yours, from the point of view, depending on where you are, I want to make a suit, where do I go to get it? Or designer, I want to pick a design costume and whatever it is, I go to certain people because of, the, of their reputation, what quality they're giving. Pricing can also be a signal for your brand positioning. Depending on where I am and how I sell this and to whom I'm selling, there's going to be a different price. If I go to a certain grocery store in a certain location, perhaps let's say in the West, and I go to buy X, and I go to a grocery store somewhere in the deep of the South, the prices are going to be different. Depends on where you are positioned and what you're selling. Quality might also be different. Pricing strategies. Pricing strategies. Strategy should be consistent with the company's overall strategy. Meaning to you all, what is your pricing strategy and what is your overall strategy for the business that you're in? You're doing more than one thing. You're doing different things. What is your overall strategy? I have a friend of mine who's who is in law and is semi-retired. The issue here is that the perspective is that this is for me, it's pro bono work. I don't charge big prices. I am doing this out of my interest in helping people. And therefore, that's her strategy. And overall, she's a Good price per she give good pricing and she's making money notwithstanding. She's comfortable in those circumstances. On the other hand, some of us are just starting our businesses and we now need to establish ourselves. And if I have to put, put price it slightly different in the marketplace because I do not yet have the reputation. On the other hand, I am senior counsel, I am well known, and I'm charging you $7,500 an hour for my consultation so there are courses for horses and there's pricing based on the business and the type of business and where your business is at and positioned and therefore there must also be an appreciation of the product's position in the life cycle that is it is in and it's useful life from the point of view that you may find depending on where your product is styles go in and out when the styles go out or going out you want to get those things off your hands quickly and therefore you might price it appropriately to get rid of it on the other hand the new things that are coming in you see this with cars and i'm also in the united states yeah? um, models are changing and because the model is changing prices come down so that we can get rid of the old stock 
to make way for the new stock. And we reduce the price of the vehicles and we do so. Trinidad is a slightly unique place. I mean, we, we, don't, we don't see that happening at all in any significant way. But again, it's a way of doing things. So from a pricing strategy point of view, therefore, in some industries, price promote by the concept of quality. What am I offering? Pricing might be a signal to your branding position and where you're positioned it. Uh, pricing strategies could also be determined by what is the overall strategy of your business, or you must have an appreciation of where you are in the life cycle, the useful life of your product or service. All of this is heavily dependent on the balance of power in the business. Where's this power base? Where's this power base in terms of its balance of power? Is it with suppliers? Buyers? Where's the position of competitive rivalry in your business? What about the threat of substitutes? Or the threat of new entries to the marketplace? Supplier power is dependent on the number of suppliers in the market. The size of these suppliers, the uniqueness of the service that you're providing. I want to emphasize that in particular. Because many of us, as we say in local parlance, we watch, we put and we jump in. But we're not taking time to understand how do we make ourselves of value by being different to meet a market need. What about the ability to substitute? What about the cost of changing or, sub or, or substituting? Um, the telephone companies, TSTT, Digital, and they would lock you into contracts to try and keep you with them. And therefore, you can't easily change. Supplier power determines how you, um, alongside other people supplying the same service, will deal and react to the marketplace, how the marketplace will react to you. What about if the buyers have power, if you have quite a large number of customers, the size of each or the order the customer is making, if a customer is giving you more, more than 100 pieces, I need to look at my discounts and my pricing, they have weight and power. What's the size of each order that they're, they're dealing with? The differences between competitors, so that you're, you're, you're alongside the next person in the market and you're trying to sell um, the same thing. How do I get mine off the, off the plate as opposed to the other person? What pricing positions I'm taking? How sensitive you are to the price? People shop around. Some of us don't like to shop around, but people shop around in order to, to determine where's the best price I should pay for something because things are similar. On the other hand, what about competitive rivalry? How many competitors are in the market? What choices do we have? What differences are there in quality? What other differences exist in the product or service that you're providing? Is there any switching costs? Can my clients move one to the other easily? What about customer loyalty? I was looking at talking to one of my hairdresser clients recently. And as a result of this whole coronavirus issue, you Going forward, you have, or as a hairdresser, you have to get into the technology where your customers are able to book online and, and communicate with you, and you have your whole database of your customers, and really be able to service your customers more effectively. That's the conversation we need to be having. Because your customer loyalty will not only come because of the quality that you're presenting, but the relationships, customer service relationships that you have. What about the cost of leaving the market? Does it cost you to get out of the business? Is there a threat of substitutes? What's the cost of changing to those new substitutes? Or the threat of new entrants? There's a balance of power out there in the marketplace. And depending on what service or product you provide, you may either have it or you don't, or you're just simply following the line of people that are in the market and doing what they're doing. Those of you with the requisite skill of design, some of you are very unique design. There's where you have a value differential. And therefore, based on that value, you can make your differentiations in your pricing. On the other hand, um, I have a quality skill. I've nurtured that skill, 
it is great. I am known for the abilities that I have, and therefore I can create a differential in price. So we need to understand where the power is in this, in this market. Who has it? And on what basis do they have that power? And how can it be affected or changed? Let me give you some examples of this, if you don't mind. When the only game in town um, had to deal with uh, the strategies that are adopted by Google, for example, almost 50% of tablet computers users say that they use them to read newspapers back then, magazines. And since Apple iPad tablet computers at one time represented 75% of the market for tablets being sold, Apple felt it like it had a newspaper market and magazine publishers locked in. And because Apple felt like that, they were charging these suppliers a little added cost. What happens when you do that? The market responded. Google came in and did what they had to do. As Google, as Apple announced what they were doing, Google responded. And the competition starts. We are not, we might not be big as the Apple and the Googles of this world. But it's the same thing. The 40 or 50 of you listening to this morning are either in the same or similar business arrangements. And therefore, you have to look and begin to appreciate the market that you're in and your uniqueness in that market. And why you need to appreciate this is also too because the market has many channels. The market has many channels. You have producers going directly to consumers. That's a direct channel. You have producers going to retailers, going to consumers. Somebody comes in the middle. That's an added cost, time, effort. You have producers going to wholesalers, going to retailers, going to consumers. More tiers, more added cost. Producers to distributors or producers to wholesalers and distributors and somewhere in the middle, we have an agent or broker cutting a deal. All these various tiers in the market, not only add cost, but it also gives you a structure as to how the market operates. Many of you are sole traders and many of you have a skill that you're either designing and passing it on for people to sew, or you have the ability to do both design and sew. And therefore, you're going direct to market um, to your consumer. On the other hand, for those of you who might be looking at it differently, you might be doing some manufacturing in some small way, and you're passing it as a retailer direct to the consumer. So you may have a shop front or you might be making a, your, your product in, in a manufacturing arrangement and you have to get it to some wholesaler, um, some wholesaler. Whatever it is, we need to understand the network in the market. How is this working? How many people make up this market? Where are they and how are they in relation to me? Another bit of insight is what happened with, let's say, Walmart and the pricing for jeans. Walmart is well known, and we all know Walmart store. They were selling a pair of jeans at $19 per pair instead of 23. Walmart, as a retail store, as a, uh, using Levi's Stratus jeans. What happened to Levi's Stratus is what happens to many manufacturers who deal with Walmart, given its size. Often, Walmart sets the price. And the manufacturer has to figure out how to make a profit based on the price given by Walmart. In the vice Stratus's case, it revamped its distribution and production to serve Walmart and improve the overall and improve the overall um, delivery systems. So depending on where you are, depending on what you do and how you do it, you need to understand the market that you're in, you need to understand your costing and costing details, you need to understand your pricing and pricing strategy and that of your overall strategy of your business. And it's all these things that will eventually 
eventually work out as to what you are doing and how you're doing it. The tools that you have been given will be given today as we go along is the understanding of costing, how you develop the cost, and then how you look at pricing and the strategies for pricing and how you will deliver those strategies into the marketplace. So common pricing strategies are either cost plus pricing, market-based pricing, premium pricing, penetration pricing, cost-based, what we call loss leadership, tiered pricing, segment market pricing, value-based pricing. Um, these price strategies can be different for different businesses operating even in the same industry. Let's take a look at this cost plus pricing arrangement now. So we're setting a price for your product or service based on the cost of producing or distributing that product or service, plus some desired element of profit. We are setting a price, cost plus. You decide what that margin will be. Some people in the market or industry that we're in would want to look simply at a 10 or 20% markup, 25% markup, reasonable profit. That markup, the markup that you put on must cover not just the cost of producing the item, but also cover your overheads and still leave you with some degree of profit. So the process therefore of us identifying, categorizing and evaluating the various expenses that go into production and sale of products or services is where we are costing. So we wanna look at all the various elements that make up this thing called pricing. So why do we need to appreciate this thing called cost? If we really don't know it, if we don't understand the whole cost, we're not in the game. If we don't understand our cost structures, we are not in the game of business. We must know cost in order to set a price. We must know the cost in order to set the price. Very simple, we must know cost to get a price. It gets a bit complicated. We must know the cost to value the inventory we have on hand. Many of you who are tailors and seamstresses have materials that you have stuck up. People were making masks because they had cloth at home. But that cloth that you had, had value. That cloth represented some inventory that you have, some stock that you have. And you have to understand the cost of keeping that stock at your base of business. We want to know cost to determine our profitability. We want to look at that cost to determine our profitability. And we want to support the decisions that we make in the business based on an understanding of the cost. So therefore, if it is that you wanted to, to sell something and I'm coming to negotiate, in some countries that you go to, let's say you go to China and you go to some of those big malls in China where they sell clothes and stuff, there are many multiple stores all around and they're all attracting you based on price negotiation. So as you step in and you say, there's the price, you can then get into a negotiation and a bartering. There's some societies or cultures that like to get into that kind of barter and, and discussion and negotiation to get a better price. You need to understand your cost to make the right decisions on your price. You need to understand your cost to make the right decisions on your price. It will also help you all in planning your business more effectively. It will help you in planning your business more effectively. So what are costs? What are the costs that we are getting or having to 
uh, um, put together to better understand what this course thing is, which is on salaries, rental of premises, cost of operating a plant or machinery, equipment and its maintenance, or utility bill, inventory, telephone and internet, insurance and advertising. These are some cost elements, but let me see if I can get directly to some of you for you to appreciate what you need to be doing. For those of you who understood and participated in the record keeping and cash management program, you would have appreciated the importance of keeping your records. And it's important that in the businesses that you all are in, that you keep proper records so that you have good and accurate information. If you have accurate information and good information, this, these costs you should be able to easily extract from the business. You should be able to easily extract. If you do not have these costs or know these costs uh, easily, then please put in place a system of accounting so that you appreciate and understand what these costs are that you have. Let's get into the costing now. So we know all these various elements of cost. Let's look at the costing methods that the accountants would use. And let's look at the methods of that they will appreciate and understand what the costs are. A traditional cost management system will determine use units or volume-based drivers such as direct labor cost, direct machine hours, to assign what we call production overheads cost to the cost of an object. A unit or volume-based driver such as direct labor. What is the direct labor cost? Time spent by an hours, cost of the hours multiplied by time spent or machine hours. How long I use the machine for by some rate of charge and assign some production overheads to the cost of the object that you're making. So there are two types of costs that you need to concern yourself about. You need to concern yourself about your direct cost and your indirect cost. You need to concern yourself about your direct cost, what you can see, and the indirect cost that is not necessarily directly related to the product of goods that you're making. Your direct cost, a cost that can be traced easily and accurately to the cost of the object that you're dealing with. So I am making a dress. I have some direct cost. I know the material that I have bought, the trimmings and the accessories to that um, dress that I have to put together. I have the direct cost. But there's some indirect cost too. No matter what you do, you have direct and you have indirect. The indirect cost of that cannot be directly traced easily and accurately to the cost of the object. Cannot be easily and directly traced to the object. It might not even be feasible, economically feasible to actually do that tracing. But you'll do some degree of what we call allocation to take account of it in some way. So what are the costs therefore that you have, you have to assess with the businesses that you're running is, what is the direct cost? What's your indirect cost? Direct cost would be like your material cost. So you know the material that I'm, that I'm using. And then all of a sudden, what has happened to the rent for the house that I'm living in? What about the utility bill that I'm paying every month to keep electricity and internet to this and access to the, Tech uh, communication into the business. What about those costs? How are we recovering those costs in the pricing that we are making? The direct cost is easy, you know. The direct cost is very, very easy. You can link the cost directly to what you're putting out. So here, what I am now going to go to the tailor and I'm going to make a suit. The tailor knows that he has cloth. The tailor knows that he has to get his thread. The tailor knows that he has to put all that together. 
and the labor cost might be direct because all you're working on for the week is on this suit. But what about the cost of the telephone that he has to the store or the shop? What about the utility bill that he has to pay in terms of electricity to the shop? What about the rent that he has to pay? So for everything that I'm selling, I have to try and recover elements that are indirect cost to your product. You have to attempt to recover in everything that you are selling the indirect cost to your product. So some of us will want to buy and sell things. Some of us are providing a service. So here's what I am a designer. And I sit down and I design and I'm buying the material and I, and I organize the labor to do it. I have to take account also of other costs that are associated in me bringing this thing to life. So take account of the direct and take account of the indirect. Later on in the presentation, I will provide you with a template that you can use to, to assemble these costs in a structured manner and will, so that you'll get an answer quite easily with regard to what your pricing and costing would be. We want to introduce this thing called absorbing of overheads. Absorbing of overheads. Now, when you say overheads, and for better understanding, these are costs that are not necessarily directly related to the productive element that I am dealing with. It must take into account the indirect services used to support the manufacturing of a product. I need to take account of the indirect services. So let's get on into looking at what these indirect services are. There are three stages of this process in trying to determine our soap cost. The first stage is to identify and collect the overhead cost associated with both the production and service cost centers. Then we charge these costs to the production cost centers via some method of apportionment. And then we have something called the overhead cost of our product. That's plain English. Let me break it down to you in a more practical way. Remember what we are doing here is, I said to you that you have direct cost and you have indirect cost. For us to better understand the indirect cost, indirect cost are to be spread over some period of time, because if I'm looking, if I'm producing for a month, let's say, I have the utility bill for the month. I have those bills that are monthly that I'm paying that I have to spread over a 12 month period. So I have these bills I pay off monthly at the end of the year. Let's say I pay um, $200 in my, my utility bill. Then at the end of the year, it's a $2,400 $2, bill that I must recover over all my productive, productive output. It is something the accountants call the absorption rate. And therefore, we're looking at that from the point of view that we want to look at some common activities that we'll measure to get that rate that we'll apply to our for indirect costing. So we're going to look at this thing called direct labor cost. What is the direct labor cost? Now, labor tends to be fixed. Labor tends to be fixed. And we want to know the direct hours that you spend. So some of you maybe say yourself that you have a steady way of working eight hours or four hours a day. It's all up to you. Those are your direct hours that you contribute to the work that you're doing. You have your direct labor cost, which is the, the rate that you are charging for the time that you are spending doing the work that you are doing. Each of you ought to have, in the way you cost your work, you must know what you desire to make from it, not from a view of profit, but from a, a view of, so for better or want of a better understanding, what salary that you want to get from doing this. Not a profit, but what you need to earn for the labor that you contribute to the, doing the work that you're doing. Therefore, that must be an element of your costing. And then if you're using machinery, then we want to know what is the machine hours, how long the machine is going to be used um, and doing whatever work that we're doing. So what we have to first determine, what is the budgeted overheads of 
a production cost center divided by the budgeted level of activity that we have. Let me just take time. We will go this slowly, and I want you to appreciate and understand it as we go. We want to take what is got an absorption rate. And therefore, in a 12-month period, in a 12-month period, we have certain direct costs that we need to look at. And therefore, we want to look at cost associated with labor. You can work any number of hours in a day, and you want a monthly payment, which is generally a fixed payment of, let's say, $25 or $3,000 per month. So the labor rate, labor cost, and the number of hours spent will give me my salary at the end of the month. I repeat, the labor cost, that the hours that you spend working on a monthly basis, and the cost, the rate applicable to that will give me my labor cost. What you all need to do is to determine, I'm not talking profit yet, what uh, is my monthly personal earnings that I want to get for my sole trader business? Multiply that by 12, and that is what you hope to get on an annual basis from doing this work. What is the budget that you want to get? So I want to make $75,000 per annum or $100,000 per annum. That's my budgeted labor cost for the year. How often I'm going to use the machine that I'm using? How many hours am I going to use this machine for and apply a rate of, of output how much this machine is going to produce? So the budget overheads of a production cost center is my, let's say my salary, annual salary divided by what is the output I'm expecting from me using that machine divided by the output I'm getting and that is the rate of recovery that I want to get on each of the products that I'm selling. At the end of the day, what is my objective? My objective is to come to a point whereby I am aware that besides my direct costs and direct uh, materials and everything as di direct cost, I must now allocate what we call overheads to the cost of the product. To determine the cost of overheads that I'm recovering, I would like you to sit down and budget for a 12-month basis your indirect cost. What is the cost that I'm dealing with my labor? What is the, because that is fixed. What is the cost I am dealing with my other utilities and stuff? And with those total and budgeted figures, I will determine what I intend to recover. And of course, you have the cost of materials. Now, I want to have a conversation in a practical way then with you. And as we go along in this practical conversation, you will see what I am talking about. So let us cast our minds back a little bit and come to a place whereby I would like us to identify and look at what are the various costs that a carnival band, what would be the various costs that a carnival band would have and what do you notice about the cost outlined? What do you think the carnival band will be? So let's have a con let's look at that and, I'll, and we'll have that ex exchange in terms of a carnival band will have various costs. And what you have to do is to first identify what is the total cost that we have with regard to these overheads. So I want you to you sit down and determine what is the total cost of, let's say, your utility bills for the year. What is your cost of your labor cost for the year? What are the other associated indirect costs that you have for the year? And come up with what you see there as $1.6395 million. So in a 12-month period, this is the kind of money I would need just to simply cover my overheads. We will know how much the volume is. In other words, how much units I am going to produce. In this case, I am producing 800 costumes. The mass band leader will determine what his budgeted overheads are in terms of 
labor cost and all the utilities, all those fixed costs he has, he would have to meet. And divide the budgeted volume of output for the 12 month period to come up with something that we call the overhead per unit cost. For each element that I have produced, there's a cost element for overheads that I must take into account. And therefore, we sit down and have a budget as to all the money we'll spend in a 12 month period in relation to the overhead expenses, labor, machinery. What is the output this is supposed to produce? 800 carnival costumes. And therefore, when I know the budgeted cost, I come up with a budgeted per unit. My end game now is to get to the cost of the product. Then I look at my variable cost. There's the costume material, which is 700 per unit. The truck has this other variable cost. We provide drinks and refreshments, $600. We also provide food, $300. These are variable cost elements based on the number of people in the bank. That comes up to $1,600 per unit. I am budgeting 800 units. And therefore, the minimum selling price that you should be selling at would be the variable cost and some recovery of our overhead rate. So the cost I'm looking at is the $2,049 plus the $1,600 of variable cost means that I can now sell at a minimum selling price of $3,649. You see why these costumes in a nuts bag might be so expensive. Let's repeat that so that you understand what each of you need to do for your simple business. You might ask yourself, why am I doing this kind of thing? In order for you to understand and appreciate costing and pricing and how it impacts your business, you need to get down to this kind of detail. What I would expect you to do, or would like you to do, is to sit down and put a budget with regard to, I am the main person in this business that you all have, then what do I want as a salary at the end of a month? Money that by that by 12. Remember that I have to pay national insurance too. Remember I have to pay, um, I have to pay some other things in relation to my own service. Multiply that budgeted figure by 12 to get an annual position. I have to pay my telephone bill. What is my average bill? My average bill is $5,500 a month, multiply by 12. All right. I have to pay water rates to the house. I have to pay a rent to the landlord. What's the rent? Multiply by 12. And you come up with what we call your budgeted overhead cost. Then you look and say, okay, how much can I produce on a normal rates and times? And know that at the end of a 12 month period, these are about the best in unit volumes I can do. 800 in the case of the band leader. And therefore we have what, and we divide the total budgeted cost by the number of units produced, budgeted volume, and we get an overhead unit rate that we need to recover from what we are selling. What are the variable costs? Material, drinks and refreshments and food, and that amounts to $1,600. The $1,600 plus the budgeted volume of 20, uh, for pricing for 2049, when we combine that, that's the minimum selling price that we can sell at. In another sense, that is where we, what we say as we will break even. We will break even if we recover the variable cost and our budget overheads. And that is in a simple form, in a simple way as to how we can develop a price understanding of our business. Now, let me just say this to you. When you start to do this, I repeat it again, it is like riding a bicycle, you're not going to get it right. But I assure you, I will encourage you that if you stick with it, you get better at doing it and you get a better insight and a better understanding of what pricing is. Sit down 
and pull the paperwork together that says, what are my total overhead costs? Means these costs are not directly related to me producing whatever I'm producing, whatever I'm designing. What are the budgeted overhead costs? I want a salary out of this. How much money is that multiplied by 12? I have utility bills to pay. How much money is per month multiplied by 12? I am creating a budget. By the way, I'm living in a, in a house. I have to pay rent. What is it multiplied by 12? I have some equipment. I have some sewing machines. I have, I have um, computers, etc. What is the cost in maintaining and running these things on a 12-month basis? I have to make sure I recover those things. So I create a budget for it. And then how much output am I going to get from doing all of this in a 12-month period? Divide that projected output by this total cost, and you get what is called a unit overhead per unit rate. That overhead per unit rate is what I need to recover from every unit that I have sold. I want that money because I have to meet these overheads. And then, of course, my variable cost. So I will do that and calculate what is my minimum selling price. It is where I will break even. It is where, from where my, when I make a discount on whatever price I finally agree to, I don't want to go below this figure because I don't want to go to a place where I'm making losses. The question that you may want to ask is, but hold on. And at the end of the year, the budget that I have might be a wrong figure, the wrong budget. I might spend more, spend less. I do agree. And therefore, what we will do at the end of a year, we'll compare the budget to the actual to see whether or not we were doing too much or too little. And in the following year, we will either seek to recover or to adjust our prices downwards because in a competitive place. But doing the budget beforehand, understanding the per unit rate that I need to recover on a monthly basis for my overheads will help me to better price the products that I'm dealing with. I had some early questions and I think we have answered them sufficiently. We are now coming up to the time of 10.30. We want to take a 15 minute break. And when we come back, we would um, we'll come back precisely at 10.45. We'll come back precisely at 10.45. Uh, we'll start on time and we'll take you down the journey of some practical application of what we are discussing with you. Um, when you come back, I will also indicate you what my phone number is, what my email address is, so that you can shoot your questions to me afterwards if after the presentation you're supposed to get the slides and you get a template for what I call a cost sheet. And that's and we'll talk that in a little while. That cost sheet is where if you work on that cost sheet to get the overhead cost that you have to get to understand what your variable cost would be. That one piece of paper for the things that you are doing can determine your profitability or how much losses you are making in your business. So please come back. We have a lot to do and a lot for you to learn as we go down and understand what costing and pricing is all about. We take now a 15-minute break and we come back at 10:45. Thank you so much for your attention and see you in a few minutes. This conference will now be recorded. Thank you very much and welcome back. Um, we are discussing costing and pricing. And so far this morning, we looked at the various strategies for costing, where we want to compare what the competitors doing we want to do some kind of break-even pricing. We want to do some kind of package, uh, put things into a package pricing and pricing for value to some extent. We can also look at pricing for value. And these various elements or strategies of pricing, uh, we, we can only better understand them if we understand the underlying cost associated with determining what the price would be. Remember, we aim to be profitable as best as we can do. In so doing, we have come to a place where we are looking at what is the overhead recovery. It has different elements of costs. There are costs that are fixed and there are costs that are variable. There are costs where we are looking at the budgeted overheads. And therefore, we're looking at all our overheads. And come up, I'm coming up with an annual budget as to what that overhead will be. In this case, it was 1639.5. The number of units in this carnival band that we're talking about, 800 costumes. And we know that we want to recover 
and everything that we unit that we sell, we want to recover two thousand and forty nine dollars for every unit that we are selling. We know the variable costs are, and if it's eight hundred, and if the costs go up, this is what we have to recover. Then a uh, minimum selling price without profit or break even, but just where we break even, would be three thousand six forty nine. You need to understand this principle and be able to apply it to the work that you all are doing. I will give you another while a template as to how you follow and deal with that. So costs are either fixed cost or variable cost. Fixed costs remain the same regardless of what you sell. It doesn't matter. Fixed costs will remain the same. Variable costs, on the other hand, will vary based on the level of sales activity that you have. So let's sit down. Coming out of this workshop seminar, Let's sit down and work out what is our, would be our fixed cost and what will be our variable cost. It's important. You know why it's important? Because we want to know that we are actually pricing properly. We want to know that we're actually making sure we cover all our cost elements and be able to negotiate pricing decisions to the benefit of your business. So to do that, let's understand that if I had a lemonade stand, the rent for the lemonade stand is a fixed cost. The wages that I'm paying myself while working in the lemonade stand and my, and my daughter or my wife is a fixed cost. The machinery that I use has a fixed cost for its maintenance. The costs that vary is if I have materials that I'm using on a daily basis to make the lemonade that I'm dealing with. And if I take on a new worker in peak season, that is a person I'm coming in that will go out based on the volume of activities that I have. I want you to understand this and apply it to your own circumstance. What is my circumstance? My circumstance is that I am operating from home. There's a mortgage payment or rent on my house. What is it? It is a monthly fixed rate of $3,000. That's my rent. What do I intend to pay myself as a seamstress, a designer, whatever it is? What do I intend to pay myself? Okay, the market rate outside there is good, and I would like to at least have $5,000 a month from the work that I'm doing. Minimum. And therefore, that is also your fixed cost. Multiply that by 12 to get your annual fixed cost for your wages. Multiply your rent by 12 to get the annual rental fee that you're paying. And then there's this machinery that I'm using, be it the computer, be it the machine, whatever it is. There's a cost associated with running that. There's an electricity bill. There's a maintenance cost that we have to meet. And therefore, we will allocate that to on a 12 month basis to determine what is our fixed cost for the 12 month period. We have our variable cost that will vary based on our output. And therefore, we know that we want to be able to produce in this carnival band 800 units. But you, as designers or seamstresses or whatever, have you will know how much units you are able to put out on a monthly basis, working flat out full time. And you would, and that will vary by month by month, of course, but you'll have assessment of that. So I want my fixed cost and I want my variable cost. Once I have those two, I can determine what my minimum selling price can be. Fixed cost, variable cost, I can get to my minimum selling price. Then and only then, I am able to add a percentage of markup and determine what profit I am trying to make. There's a school of thought in some businesses, such as the one I run, that there's to determine cost, there are three components. 
the cost that you have to recover, cost associated with doing the work, then there's the cost that pays me, and then there's the cost that we talk about as profit. Those are the three components that I need to recover. In this case, it is the fixed cost, the variable cost, and your profit that you want to deal with to see what your selling price is going to be. It's as simple as that for you to determine what is your reasonable selling price. I want to repeat to you that this work only gets better with practice. And therefore, coming out of this seminar with the, with the, with the notes that I give to you and the template that I give to you, sit down and start putting these numbers together and looking at it. it it's not going to be right the first time. It might not be right the second time, but I will assure you, as you begin to look at it and manipulate the numbers and look at the numbers, you will get greater insights into what your costing and pricing ought to be for the business that you're running. It is valuable for you to do. Pricing, therefore, I must understand my cost. There's fixed cost and there's variable cost. So let's now do and get a bit more into this and introduce something called semi-variable cost. It's mixed. Some consultants have it. In the case of real estate agents, um, there's a fixed component and a variable component to what they're doing. Real estate agents are often paid a retainer, whereby there's a fixed cost. And based on what they sell, they get a commission. That's the variable component. You have to decide that you might be working for somebody and you have a fixed cost in relation to the work that you're doing, but for every additional unit you have made over X amount, you have a variable component. And therefore, you need to look at those costs and be able to differentiate what those costs are. At the end of it, fixed cost plus variable cost equals your minimum selling price, break even. You add on top, top, top of that, your profit. Why are we doing this? Why are we trying to get onto this thing called fixed cost and variable cost? Why, are, why is it important for us? Why must I waste time doing this? Let me tell you why. If you don't spend the time sitting down to assess and understand the cost that you have, then you're not in a place to make decisions about your business. Cost volume profit analysis is a tool for decision making. And therefore, if I understand my fixed cost, understand my variable, my variable cost, and how I do simple arithmetic, I will be able to determine quite a number of things. Should my selling price change? Should my selling price change? I know where I break even. I understand what's happening in the market. You go in my belly with the doubles doing something extra. I then will do something extra in penal, and all of a sudden I am at a price level. At the same time, I could understand how my prices can move. More important though, how many units must I sell in order to break even? Meaning, how many units must I sell in order to make sure I don't lose money? Breaking even. Understanding my fixed cost and my variable cost will tell me the number of units of product that I must sell in order for me to break even. All right. That is one of the critical decisions that need to be made. And I'll come back to that in a minute. What about the other side of the equation? Where you're saying how many units must be sold to reach some targeted level of profit that I'm looking for. To reach some targeted level of profit I'm looking for, how much units I need to sell. Here's where it gets nice. Because at some point in time in my decision making and I've made certain decisions, I will know that I am profitable. I will know that I'm good and very profitable. Or I am very comfortable and happy. 
Or on the other hand, you will know very well if you're sick and you have problems come in. So you need to understand this issue of fixed cost, variable cost, and profit. Please sit down with the template I've given to you, I've given to you shortly, and work out what your fixed cost would be. You will work out what your variable cost would be and be able to see what your unit pricing minimums and margins are going to be like. That's why we have to understand this thing called costing and pricing. That's why we have to understand how we take our fixed costs, the rent of the building that we are living in, the utility bill that we pay for telephone and lights and add up the bills for 12 months. You know, we take the other fixed costs, water rates, and add them up for 12 months and look at all the elements of cost that are fixed in the business that I'm running and know by the number of units that I have to recover, how much, what's the recovery rate per unit of output that I am making? Remember the carnival band? Once I get to that per unit of output, I am able to have a fixed, a variable cost position that I know about now based on the number of units that I'm producing. And I can then get to a place where I know what my fixed cost would be per unit, my variable cost per unit, and I have a minimum selling price. What a lovely place to be. Because if I know that in the back of my head, when people come to me to negotiate on pricing with me, I know exactly what my floor position is and I'm going below that. Because if I go below that, I know I'm making losses. If on the other hand, they come to me and we negotiating, I am smiling with them because I know where I reached this point and they are satisfied, I am still highly profitable. Why does when these people call a sale in these shops and you hear a sale, you're going in leaving happy, smiling because they tell yourself you get it cheap, but they're very happy and smiling because why? They know they make money on it. It's a cash flow issue. They get the cash in, product out, they still make money they understand what their basic minimum selling price would be by understanding what their fixed cost is and what their variable cost would be. Once you understand this, ladies and gentlemen, it is the key to you understanding your business that much better. But once you understand cost, I want us to also look at cost and strategies as to how we would reduce cost. I say this to say to you, even in the context of COVID-19, there are implications to our business on the cost of running and doing business. Before COVID-19, I would have met you some in some building somewhere to present this program. The best I could do in a classroom is 15 to 20, 25 persons. Today, I'm talking to 60 and 62 persons in one session. How efficient that is. If you understand cost, it will tell you now that in future, what you may find is that people might not be going to classroom work anymore. They might do some of it, yes, because there's some value in doing it. But in future, I will change the way I cost my business by making sure I could maximize output at a reduced cost. So, what we have, you need to understand things that you can do to reduce costs. Don't do like what you see in the picture here. Don't be your own doctor. All right? Don't go and be your own doctor. What I'm suggesting to you is look at the things that you can do to reduce cost. You need to develop a structure in your business that makes greater use of what we call variable cost. The more fixed costs you put onto your business, the more you have to make money to recover that fixed cost. So what we must attempt to do is to minimize as much as possible our fixed cost and put structures in place that we use variable cost, meaning that the more we do, the better for us. Putting in place this type of technology to do this type of program increases the number of people participating at a reduced cost. Simple, because I'd have to pay for the building, I'd have to pay for the caterer, I'd have to do everything. I give you 10 minutes, 15 minutes, go get your own snack. Cheaper, better, more efficient, more value, more productivity. Here's the other one that's also important to many of you. In whatever you are doing, and I'll talk to you about this at the end of the program, is that you need to look at the technologies that you have to use in order to make your work more efficiently done. 
what technology can I use in this business to help me to be more efficient and help me to reduce my cost? On the other hand, we need to focus on our efficiency, how efficient we are doing the business, how effectively we are doing the business. In some cases, you may want to cross-train your staff. If you have some degree of staff, you want them to be multi-skilled and, and multi-dimensioned so that they're able to do different things and more things for you at a cheaper cost. You want to find alternative uses for available resources. I was looking at a, at a television program the other day, and it amazed me to realize that, you know, as a simple thing as this, you'd want to make banana bread. You peel the banana, you take out the banana, and you put it into the, the making the bread. You could take the banana skin, boil it, cut it up and boil it, salt it, and mince it, and still go and make another banana bread with that skin. And it tastes just like a banana. When you look at the restaurant business, many of the things that we throw out as waste in your kitchen at home can be reused in the restaurant business to create efficiencies in the business. When you study carefully, you begin to realize that. In the case of, of your creative business, you find some of you, you know, you get your cloth, you buy your cloth, you keep all the ends and stuff like that. That is another way of doing it. So you want to find alternative uses for available resources that you have. You want to consider outsourcing uh, as an option, meaning you can't do everything to all people. And therefore, you may want to outsource some of your business or some of the things that you have to do to somebody who can do it better and more efficiently than you, so that that is quickly and better done. And you focus on what is your core component of your business and get that done effectively. So you may want to engage some people to outsource some of what you do to make sure you get the greater benefit coming back to you in terms of output and efficiency. You also want to avoid penalties and fines for tardy payments. Um, bank interest. Um, I speak for no bank, but I will say this much to you. When you look at this whole thing of deferring of payments and installments, a bank that defers your payment and installment does not stop your interest charges. And therefore, it might be worth your while to pay what you can, but not ask for the deferral. Because in the same circumstances, they are not coming to you to beat you up for non-payment. They got it to pay something, but that minimizes your interest charges. On the other hand, you have um, statutory payments to make, make them on time. When you don't make them on time, you have something called penalty and interest that sometimes will come down to 100%. The rate of interest charges. So you want to avoid these non, or not non, but those charges that are not directly related to what you're doing. You have to avoid that. And more importantly, as far as cost is concerned, you need to shop around. What you're going to find going forward in the business world is that true technology we will be able to connect closely with people of all kinds of skills and capabilities and at the various costs that may be beneficial to you. I have known somebody in the music industry and they're putting together a, a, a CD and they're talking to people out of Budapest in Hungary and linking with somebody else in the United Kingdom and pulling together the CD at reasonable pricing. You're all creative people. You have the, 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 the designers that are available to you are designers throughout the world using technology. You can so well, you can do these things well, you're also marketing your skill set, and therefore people can come to you because of your capability to do what you're doing once you can market it and put it well out there. So some of the ways that you can use to reduce the cost of what you are doing is develop structures in your business that focus on variable cost because variable costs will only come about when you're doing it. Minimize your fixed costs and keep it low as possible. Try not to get in contractual payments that have these fixed cost elements attached to it. Try to make sure your costs are variable. Use technology as far as you can. Focus on efficiency and doing things right and effective. Constrain people if you have staff, constrain them so that they can multitask, multidiscipline people, that they can do various things for you rather than just one thing alone. Go on, go on the days. I mean, we're not there yet, perhaps, but we're going on the days of this thing called a job description. And all I'm doing is what is on my job description. That, that, that is out of date now. Consider outsourcing as an option, avoid penalties and interest and fines. And that will be good for you. What are the issues associated with cost plus pricing? 
So we have the fixed cost, variable cost. We know what the minimum selling price is. You're doing all the things necessary to improve your cost structures that, that you have. If you have too much sales, when you're doing cost plus pricing, you may find yourself in a place where the cost per unit is increasing and you're not paying attention. That cost per unit can increase very simply because by the high volumes that you are doing, you're taking on either added cost that you didn't cater for and not properly allocated and assigned. On the other hand, you have in different um, of consumers, people don't really care. You know? Some people might not care. And they might not be looking for your, for your cost increase. Or in fact, they might be so sensitive that they might be looking for it. You have to be careful of what kind of consumer you're dealing with and be mindful of the cost always. So that you, that's why you have to be conscious. Right? And the business that I operate in, because of the technology that you have, you push a button and I know exactly what my cost structure is at the end of a month. I also know what my revenue would be. I said to the class with regard to record keeping and cash management, you need to know as a business person on a monthly basis what your revenue and expenditure is. For the purpose of cost and pricing, from a business person point of view, you need to know what your pricing is, what your costs would be, and what margins you're making for products per unit of time spent. And of course, you want to understand what's a reasonable markup. Now, what is reasonable? What is reasonable to me might not be reasonable to you. And therefore, the market in which you're operating in, you need to be conscious and aware of what is happening in the market and what the changes are, because what might be reasonable today for you might not be so tomorrow because of all the things that are changing. Pay attention to it because if you're in a cost plus pricing strategy, then these things will be things that you have to be conscious about. If, on the other hand, you are looking at what I call market based pricing, what we call here, when you look at market based pricing, I'm looking at pricing, comparing prices of my product to others and services to others in the marketplace. So, pricing of products, services based on what the market is willing to pay or what the competitors are charging. Some of us don't like to do the work. Some of us find the easy way out. And the easy way out is to go and what, what is about charging the market? I'll put that price on it. Not understanding that they have arrived at their price based on their internal cost structures, based on their technologies, based on their abilities, based on their overheads. You have to determine that for yourself and for your business. Market-based pricing also has the implication that you may want to set a price, you know that your, compet your competitor is setting a price at $100, and you say, well, I want to jump in the market, I could go to $100 too, not a problem. And put you on the $100, but then somebody might realize, but wait, I might go to 90 because I want to get the business. And all of a sudden, you're at 90, they drop to 90 too, and again, the cycle starts, and all of a sudden, you're battling each other in the competitive market space, and the person that is winning is the customer simply because your prices to compete, you're lowering your prices without an understanding of your cost. And you wake up and realize that you're losing money. We must know where our costs are in order for us to appreciate how we must price. Issues that are associated with this thing called uh, based on pricing. If there are substitutes in the marketplace, then your your customers can go to the substitutes so sometimes pay attention to what pricing you have in the market you must be determined whether or not you can afford to match the pricing because i could come to you and you say well you know my i want to get this from you but the guy down there is giving me that 90 dollars you have to understand that you can give it at 90 you can give it at 85 you can give it at 75 and still be profitable how much you have not, you must know that in your headspace. You can't stop. Let me, let me go and calculate this now. Come back here just now. Time is money and time is decision making. So it is better you do the work up front. So that when you engage in the decision making, you have the information to decide what you're dealing with. Be prepared for a price war. Don't mind what you do. Be prepared for a price war. Um, you could be a consultant, you could be a designer, you could be a C. It doesn't matter. There, there are possibilities of a price war. When a Caribbean star got into their price war, 
Carib understood what their cost structures were. Who started the war in the first place? Stag. The war started with Stag. And when the war and the battle started, they didn't have the deep pockets to do what they needed to do, and therefore they lost the battle. When you're doing this business, understand your core structures and be able to determine what is your best price and your lowest price where you are still profitable. So I have market-based pricing. You're comparing with others in the marketplace, it's what your pricing would be. But then again, you have also what we call premium pricing. Premium pricing is where we are setting a premium for the product that we have. When we're talking about Apple and these kinds of technologies that are available, you're trying to charge a higher price. You might start at a higher price, and all of a sudden you can start to progressively get a lower and lower price. Or particularly useful for you, you might have a great market position as the first mover into the marketplace, and therefore you can charge the higher price. And over a period of time, you can reduce that price going forward. But you can only charge a premium if there's some degree of quality, some kind of brand name that people will go for or go after. You could use this premium pricing for what we call exclusive products. And this will allow you from a premium pricing point of view to maximize your profit. Likewise, there are issues associated with premium pricing. Premium pricing depends on your credibility. Premium pricing could happen if I have some kind of patent or some kind of copyright, and for a period of time I have what's, what's some kind of legal protection. And premium pricing is only available for a certain time. It is only available for a certain time. So some of you are doing designs and your designs are quite creative and you put them out there quickly. You gain a reputation, people are coming to you. And for a while that is good. But some other young Turk is around the corner with their new stats and new technologies and new capabilities, and that can shift. So you, you got to understand that when, you, when you're pricing and you're looking at a premium, it's only there for a time. And you have to determine what that time is, and the market will determine it for you. You want to do some penetration pricing. You want pricing where you want to penetrate a market. And you want to get in the market at a level that you want to make sure that you're compete competitive. Prices are set very low to capture market share. For some of you uh, small and micro enterprise people, you cannot significantly impact the price in the marketplace. So you try to come in and you try to say, okay, I'll go a bit low to get people to come to use me and build a reputation that way. Usually it's done when you're trying to introduce yourself or introduce a new product into a market space. And you try to price it so you build you build market. Over time, you gain a reputation and then you can change your pricing. So penetration pricing, that too is temporary. If I want to do penetration pricing, I have to be careful because it is only be for a time. It's high risk. You can lose money with penetration pricing if you don't understand the numbers well. And with penetration pricing, profits are small. Penetration pricing also relies on high turnover. So you want higher volume at a low margin to gain better money. Psych from a psychological point of view, the market has conditioned itself to a low pricing. So if people get into price wars and fighting and, and I will give you the better price and the lower price, you're only damaging the business and the market that you're in. You have little money to reinvest. And therefore, there's the ability to keep up with the demand that you're having. So do not jump into the market that you're in and tell yourself that you can you, I will do penetration pricing and be at a lower price. I don't think you should be doing that. You should be looking at, at your market and building it slowly and try to build a, a reputation for yourself. You have what's called lost leadership. And lost leadership, um, depending on how big you are in the business. You can sell products 
where you can sell at a price below the cost. And that is also challenging, but you, you have to understand it. You're seen as trying to get a foot in the door. So you guys are now starting. You know, for some of the things I'm doing, I might go a bit low to sort of get the business. You have a lot of things going out now, whereby let's say you are, you are you're doing sewing and stuff, and you have to do uniforms for the banks or wherever have you that you're doing these uniforms. These things come out on a tender basis. To beat the tried and tested and proven suppliers, you want to be competitive and you want to be a price uh, in a particular way, but you might want to put some things at a loss and some things you need to price in a manner that you want to make your profit back on it. Not, you can't be going one dimension. You, if you, once you're paying in the loss leadership arena, you ought to have multiple product capability so that just one product can either cause you to lose the entire shirt uh, or you can have where well, you can spread the risk that you have by having multiple products in the market space. So you want to bundle products. You can do buy one, get one free. Really, is it free? Not really, because you're combining things that overall, you, on average, you still remain profitable. Some of the issues are associated with this kind of pricing strategy. It can be sustained over the long term, don't mind what you do. It can be sustained over the long term, and therefore, uh, it's only for a short period of time. It requires some degree of investment in order for it to be sustained. When you have the price wars between Digicel and TLT, do you think they could continue doing that? Look at what happened. Seven years, eight years ago, the ship dealers and the dealers for TSCT were being well paid. And all of a sudden, as market changes and market demands, less distributors are in place and the profitability for distributors are small. Right? You look at CPEP contractors, let's bring it home in a different way. When CPEP contractors first came out, the revenue that they were making was quite good. People didn't believe it, but they were doing well. And then in the, sec in the second um, time cycle of CPEP contractors, the money started to get less and less and less. And now to some, they're barely making it. So you've got to appreciate that when you in, get into these into business, um, what strategies you're playing and be able to counterbalance uh, those strategies to not to survive over the long term. If you're a CPEP contractor, one ought to be uh, doing other things while still doing what, what your CPEP works, so you actually begin to build the business other than that and have other revenue sources. In the case of Digicel and TSCT, they are changing their business model rapidly um, to a place whereby they are still doing well in terms of their revenues, but with less overheads and less um, staff. So we had tiered pricing. Tiered pricing um, is where you have different prices to different markets different prices to different markets something like you give a price where the market could bear and therefore depending on where you are in the market that's the price you try to maximize your profits as best as you can other ways of looking at it you have segmented pricing in this part my pricing arrangement you look at a situation that occurs when the company sets more than one price for the same product in different markets. For some of you are small, smaller micro enterprise people, when you're working, when, when I come through your door, that's one price. But when I'm working online, that's a different price. In different markets, same product. If you are not in a dimension yet where you have an online presence, an online business, something that you need to consider, and we'll talk about that in a minute as we look at the pricing issues. Price segmentation can happen in the following ways. You can have seasonal pricing. Depends on what season I'm looking at, right, the price would be. Hotels do that um, quite effectively. Product and service characteristics, depending on what product or service I want, I can adjust the prices accordingly. The geographical location, depending on where you are, and where you are I'm able to charge a different price based on that. In other words, the same product in Massey stores, perhaps in West Morins, be a different price in a different grocery in a different location the price is based on some kind of perceived value within that segment of the market they're getting some value for it that they seem to believe that that gives them some benefit on the other hand you uh, discounts are given for large and bulk purchases depending on the market that you're working in and the market 
that you have. There's value-based pricing. Based on the value of products or service being offered, I can give you a better price. Customers want to know, how can you help to increase income? Customers want to reduce expenses. Customers want to increase their market share. You have to be able to offer that with whatever services that you're offering to show them how they can benefit from engaging with you. You need to understand the value proposition of the customer. So the value proposition of the channel, you want to understand the product and you want to understand the customer. What product you have, what benefits does the customer get? What features do would you have on this product? And what is the experience of customers who have used this product. You need to know this. You need to know this because it, it presents the value proposition that you're dealing with. Customers on the other hand have their wants, their fears and their needs. They also have substitutes. So that you need to get into the mind of the customer and you need to understand the science of your product. Because the customer has his wants, the customer has his fears, the customer has its needs. But the customer has choice. In however you set up your business, be sensitive, sensitive to the customer and the product. Because the value proposition that you have can determine the pricing arrangements that you can put in place. There's some designers in Trinidad and Tobago I know that are well known and whatever price they call, they get. That may be for a time, but they truly understand their customers, but also the understand the kind of product that they're putting out. You need to determine the value. In the case where you're doing a value-based pricing, what value that is? Your reputation, your skill, your history, your experience. Put, there's a value to that. When you start in the business, when you start afresh, you might not be able to price at a certain level. When I started this business um, some well, more than eight years ago, I was an associate in my profession. Today, I'm a fellow in my profession, and therefore, there's a price for that. And therefore, there's a value to that because of the experience and knowledge. You too, in your creative way, in your creative industry, um, there's a value to what you're doing. And over time, with experience and understanding and skill development, you put yourself in a place where you can provide a value-based pricing. And people know when they come to you, what they expect to get. It's difficult to implement, let's be clear about that. It takes time, it takes an understanding, it takes a strategy to be able to deliver on this value-based pricing. But make no doubt about it. If you reflect properly and you determine, this is where I want to be, this is where I would like to be, and then plan to be there, I hope and someday in the future you will get there. But there are different ways of looking at it. Let's look at this burger made from a special beef, created by you know, a patty with some degree of certain special salt. And what am I trying to say to you here simply this? Depending on what I put to the market, depending on how I want to go to the market, in the United Kingdom, the burger you see in front of you is sold at a thousand pounds sterling. The burger that is in front of you sells at a thousand pounds. Thousand pounds, ten thousand eighty dollars. Special. It's elements that make up this burger cause that burger to be sold at that kind of money. What makes it special? What makes it different? What is the competitive edge or competitive advantage that this particular burger has against everything else? It's uniqueness. And that also helps you to differentiate your pricing. You want to look at alternative pricing strategies 
because the alternative pricing strategies for, the, for what you're dealing with, um, we will always have to be constantly looking at. Product or services in some cases are free. You might give some of the things away. Revenues earned in case of, let's say, Facebook from advertising. Volume and mass um, is one way of looking at it. Product is free, but you pay for the service. So say, if we give away the software, use it for free, but you're giving a price for utilization. It's a basic fee, but when you access the system, there's a further charge for what you're dealing with. Let's say LinkedIn, you're going to LinkedIn, and you want to go, go to a higher and higher level because you want more and more data, more and more information, you'll pay for it. Whatever you do, there are various pricing model alternatives, there are various pricing models that you need to develop or look at in relation to the business that you're running. Don't look at the guy next door. Don't look at, the, at the, well, your competitors down the road. You understand how they're running their business. You need to understand what value proposition you bring to the customer. And over a period of time, you build the reputation around that. <clears throat> there are the alternative um, pricing models where when you look at automobiles that you, you, you price based on some kind of features that people have, some kind of way they're doing things, razors, um, printers, in terms of providing additional service, providing additional features that you may have. But then there's a psychology of pricing. Huh? And we need to understand that psychology. We need to understand what that psychology can do for us. The psychology of pricing. The psychology of pricing or price setting. Consumers are uh, basically rational people. So you have to understand your customer very well. Comparing pricing is dangerous and it can impact on the quality that you are presenting. So don't go out there to compete with, any, with, your, with, your, with your competitor next door, willingly just like that. Understand what you are presenting. Understand your own cost structures. You need to develop your own price points and what value you bring to the table in terms of the product that you're offering. In some psychological things, as I talked to you before, remember we had this thing about 99 cents. Everything is at 99 cents. We move, we move all the cent and we still pricing at 99 cents and 98 cents and all of a sudden we can't get a cent change. Things of that is, you still understand that. And my business today, because of this whole thing of change of the coins, everything is in rounded numbers. I don't price at all with any additional denying because of that, I don't think that psychology benefits my business. All right. Once I get something free, I must understand that it's hard to pay for it. Once I get something free, it is hard to pay for it. I want to, to show you two things. Let me bring this up on the screen one time. And I will show you I think that's clear for you. Every one of you should have some kind of cost template. Every one of you should have some kind of cost template that you are using to build your cost structures. We have designed a simple one here for you, and this will be sent to you via the email coming after this um, seminar. It's very simple. And you want a date to know when it is and you want the description of what you're doing. Whatever style name you want to give it and your final selling price as you may determine it is. Sizes, depending on the size, will have the cost elements might change. So you want to know the size range that you're playing with, whatever markers and you have and, and stuff. You can, in the design of this, put a sketch as to what you're do, what you are, what you are dealing with, um, that you have as a part of your permanent record. But here's where it becomes more interesting. Remember, we want to break down our direct costs 
and our variable cost. We want to know what our fixed cost is. So from a direct cost point of view, we may know the material that we are using, whatever lining and interface might be in whatever yards that we are purchasing it at, purchasing it at and whatever unit pricing that we have. Of course, there's a value. You get a subtotal. There are trimmings that we will add in terms of buttons, pads, zippers, whatever else you may want to add. And that has its unit price per unit. You may engage some outside services. That was a cost element. You then get to your labor cost, cost of cutting, cost of sewing. Get your subtotal, you have your total cost. Based on that total cost, you will then determine what margin you want to add on to it. And determine what your retail suggested retail selling price can be. To get a retail selling price, you may want to compare what's happening in the market. You may want to determine what profit you want to have. I want to make a 30% margin. I want to make a 50% margin. You can determine that for yourself and this is my price. But you will also understand what the market is doing. So this template is given to you because we would like to see you begin to keep records of the work that you are doing. You can have the swatch regarding material. You can have a sketch of what you're dealing with that could go attached to this, to this form and you put it into some file and you have it. So you, as time goes by and you're going to do something and you want to do it a second or third time, you go back into the cost tables. You can do the recalculation of your cost to ensure that you're still making the margin that you thought you were making when you started. You're still making the margin that you thought you're making when you started. That is critical. So this is a template. This is a template that has been sent to you to begin for you to begin to look at your cost structures. I would like to, before we go to the break, um, where is it? I want to introduce you to something. I want us to take the time to look at it. It's the same thing with regard to the cost, the, the template that we are dealing with. It's a video, and I will send the link to the video in the slides when you get them. So you'll see it now, and you can go back at any point in time with the link on the video and go back and refresh your memory as to what it is. So please pay attention and let's see what is cost 